I'd love to welcome everybody back to the Independent Investor Channel. The Q2 earnings were reported just this week, and this will be my reaction to um, those numbers as they come out. I just want to premise each and every one of you guys, um, this, is a, this is an opinion-based uh, channel. I try to be as, um, as productive as I can with my dialogue, and sometimes that means providing a little bit of constructive criticism uh, to what we heard. Um, providing kudos and, 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 and accolades for some of the numbers that we heard. And I think there was a lot that were, uh, that were provided. But through the course of this video, I hope to draw a distinction between where I think this company needs a lot of work, yep, and where I think they're just killing it, and where I think some of the external factors that have come to fruition just as of late here and probably will be signed into law this week probably will provide what I've always contended to be um, an unforeseen catalyst for this company. And I think it's going to take a lot more of those. I think it's going to take momentum. I think it's going to take uh, an overwhelming interest in their product. I think it's going to take an, uh, an extreme amount of performance from their product. And I think there was so much that was released during this quarterly call that it took me a few days to go through, read the transcript, uh, read the Q&A after, evaluate the Q&A of the conference call, which I thought was the most robust of any that I've heard so far in any of the subsequent quarters. Um, I thought Thomas Healy did an absolutely fantastic job with Sherry Baker on this delivery of the Q2 results. Um, with that said, I cannot provide a headline that highlights $180,000 in top end revenue as being somewhat special. It's okay. I think at this point, it's really not important. It's really not important. And if you expect somehow that next quarter or the quarter after to somehow be some just blow out two, $3 million quarter, it ain't going to happen. Okay. They re reaffirmed the two to three mil. And I believe they'll do that. They were asked on the Q and a, whether or not they fought, thought that they would fall uh, on the low end of the range or the high end of the range. Sherry Baker suggested that they just don't know. Um, however many trucks are available and how much sales they're able to actually render will absolutely put them in that range based on what they know now uh, to be material. And that's just, that's the best that they can do. Uh, but to reaffirm the two to three million probably puts a cap on 2022 as a transition year. And this is just how stock market investing goes. This is how a company is built over time. Time really doesn't have anything to do with uh, your stock holding, okay? In other words, if this thing, let's just presume that it's going to materialize into the future, and you knew that it was going to materialize, okay? You knew it. You're 100% convinced. But that materialization wasn't going to happen until five years minimum. Would you have what it takes to hold the stock from now until then if you knew 100% if it was going to materialize? Of course you would. Of course you would. But I think what we've deliberated on with this company over the last couple of years is the unknowns. And I think those unknowns have uh, somewhat uh, dissolved away in some capacities. <clears throat> we've been introduced with new unknowns, I think. And I think that was evident by the Q&A. What's the MSRP of the rigs going to be, Thomas? And we just were not comfortable with providing that. I'll provide a little color in this video on that front. Um, you know, my question is, what incentive does Peterbilt have once we step into mass scale up uh, to, to, to continue to assist Hylion in this journey to become profitable? Uh, what's in it for Peterbilt? Um, what do they get out of the deal? Do they get an incentive for, you know, taking the time to provide the Hypertruck ERX uh, build slots along their OEM line for the benefit of Hylion, there has to be some symbiotic agreement there uh, to where both companies agree. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, where they are in the development of their hydrogen fuel cell Hypertruck ERX, um, that, that will be of interest to me. Um, and whether or not they were, are remaining along their timeline, all of this and, and much, much more uh, have developed this week. So this week was a jam-packed week full of action. And I'm going to hope to highlight as much of that action as I possibly can on this weekly Hylion video, um, highlighted this week, not only by the earnings, but the finalization and the house passing 
the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, provides for those tax incentives and credits back to the actual purchases of these products, and the Hypertruck ERX will qualify for those credits. Exciting times, guys. This is the calm before the storm. And the reason why I suggest that five-year scenario of waiting is I believe it's inevitable. And I'm willing to wait no matter how much time it's going to take to reach that end in a game that doesn't really acknowledge uh, how much time things take. It's just not important at all at this time frame. They're executing along their timeline, and we're going to talk about some of that and many, many more as we jump into the actual Q2 highlights uh, put forward by Hylion, and we're going to actually highlight that document here um, as we jump into it and we talk about um, what was able to materialize over Q2 2022. Guys, please enjoy. So I want to welcome everybody into the Hylion second quarter 2022 conference call here. This was uh, showcased on the Q&A. If you've missed any piece of the language that uh, was released within the last week and you want to know more about uh, Hylion, I encourage you to visit Hylion.com. Uh, all of their uh, information is available there, so you don't have to uh, come to the Independent Investor Channel to see my commentary on it. However, um, it does uh, lend itself valuable in striking up different opinions about the reaction um, on the call. And just on the onset, I'll give you guys my two cents. I was neutral uh, on the call. I wasn't uh, bullish or bearish. There was a few good things. There was a few very good things. Um, and there was a few bad things. And um, I'm going to share them all with you. I'm going to give you my perspective on it. Try to be as as midline with the intent of this message is to provide uh, unbiased commentary on a company that I think has a wonderful future here. And, and the verdict is still out. Make no mistake about it. Um, Thomas Healy is doing his job as the CEO to provide a very, very elegant breakdown of the progress being made in the quarter. And I, it's amazing to me how much better he gets at that delivery every single corner. I, I was very, very pleased with his uh, remarks um, and uh, equally as pleased with Sherry Baker uh, as well as a seasoned veteran um, as the CFO talking about um, the progress that's being made, um, some of the new initiatives that the company is looking to roll out. Uh, I think they got uh, better at it, and rightfully so. I thought the Q&A at the end of the call was actually the best that I've heard. I thought there were um, pieces of, of information that were questioned that I don't think we would have got two years ago. I think uh, the analysts that were on the call, I think they took the most questions this time, and I thought they were very, very appropriate as we look to um, scale through on this opportunity with Hylion. So. Uh, this was their um, uh, probably their last um, earnings call coming into what I feel like is going to be a very, very transformative uh, session. Uh, I was hoping for the best here with the earnings, full well knowing that it really didn't matter what uh, uh, top end revenue they were able to turn out this time, um, knowing that there's going to have to be a shift in this company going from kind of small potatoes into something special. There's going to have to be a catalyst, and I think we got wind of a few of those over the last couple of quarters, and I think the payoff is going to be down the line when some of these uh, federal government mandates and state uh, mandates really come down the pike and they collectively come together to benefit uh, highly on down the line. Uh, so here's the 2022 highlights. Here's the recap, um, Advanced Clean Transportation Expo recap. This is just for uh, informational uh, and collaborating with uh, industry partners. I thought that this was fantastic. One of the huge announcements from this quarter, which is interesting enough, I, I thought the stock should have popped a couple of dollars at least on this news. Hylion and Cummins announced collaboration, and there was a question that alluded to this potential for you know, Cummins just coming in and, and taking over, and it was kind of danced around. Um, I didn't um, hear Thomas Healy say, no, we are not a takeover target, but um, the, star, the stars are aligned, and uh, to be honest with you, I would be surprised if that did happen. 
Uh, however, I, I think Cummins, as bullish as I am on Hylion, if Cummins is seeing the exact same thing that we are all seeing as shareholders, it is certainly a, a looming possibility if Hylion cannot get off the ground level and be considered anything other than just a penny stock, which, my friends, it is at this point. Um, it, it really does speak to the glaring uh, reality uh, that this company has got to be able to turn out revenue. Uh, it's got to be able to project revenue. It's got to be able to beat revenue if it's going to materialize in anything in way of what we want it to be considered, and that is a growth story. Um, they can build all the trucks they want, but if they can't make revenue, um, the company's not going to go anywhere, and neither is the stock. And, and that's just the damnable misery of it. Um, so, you know, a big player like Cummins to step in and actually swoop this company up um, it, it, to suggest that it's not on the table at all uh, is um, is probably not identifying with all of the options that are out there. But uh, I don't think it's going to happen. But um, it is something that I'm watching closely as as Hylion and Cummins that was really suggested that, look, a year ago they were competitors with the 15-liter engine, and now all of a sudden they're in bed together with the collaboration, helping to get the certification. Um, their very engine is the one that's under the hood. Uh, so go figure. You can take that for what you will. I, I hope it does not. I hope Hylion is able to to do this on its own. It's, it's really going to set a poor precedence in the SPAC market uh, for years and years to come. Um, really is just suggesting that there's no way in hell that a SPAC can come into public markets and actually look to survive um, with the headwinds. Even as good as an idea as Hylion is, I think the process by nature of which they came to public markets will be snuffed out going forward. And there's no way that Hylion, uh, companies like Hylion or, or others will be able to use public markets as their uh, proving ground uh, with, with uh, adequate funding to um, to uh, execute along their business plan. So um, 190 Hypertruck ERX orders for production slots through Q22 with additional 10. Um, this was revised actually during the call, so I thought that this last 10 orders probably came through um, at or around the time that the earnings uh, reports were finalized. Um, so they basically just amended that report to push them up to about 200 right now. So um, good news, yes, uh, slow and marked progress toward an end of scaling up the back orders for Hypertruck ERX. I'm not, I'm not overjoyed by this. Um, there's a lot more questions than I have answers on this. And, uh, you know, agility is one of them. Um, you know, is, are they going to be stepping to the, to the, to the, to the plate here and realizing that thousand truck order? I, I think that's a real, it was a real black eye as far as I'm concerned. Um, to, to use that information for hype on the onset. Uh, and, and, and now we've heard nothing from agility uh, since then. I, I think it's a real, um, a, a real black eye for the company. If they're so uh, uh, interested in the, the product, I don't see why they can't step forward and do what the rest of the council has done up to this point, and that's go ahead and secure 10 orders, which is going to piss me off immensely. But you know, it is what it is. Uh, you know, if they're going to continue to be silent, I think uh, Thomas Healy addressed this on one of the Q and A's. A lot of the large companies are probably waiting for the CARB NHTSA certifications. Fair enough. Fair enough. It's not at all beneficial at all for companies to secure orders right now. NFI um, and Rwan, even those orders that came through, they're doing doing so prematurely with a landscape that is changing so rapidly so um, i do understand them waiting and to be honest with you if i was a big company i would wait um, i wouldn't secure orders to uh, uh, to make shareholders happy like myself that you know just want to see the order book growing up to uh, a level that can give us some sort of insight on there being an overwhelming demand uh, from the industry and we just don't have that uh, we're trusting that that's there we're trusting that it will come to fruition um, we're trusting that those conversations are being had, but um, I, I typically like to trust, uh, invest a little bit more on trust. This has taken uh, every bit of trust and and hope, and um, and uh, you know, really just tracking the progress and making sure that they progressing are progressing, which they are. 
um, along their timeline. But uh, it can't happen soon enough, and I'm sure that there's a lot of investors out there that uh, uh, are, are sharing in that sentiment. Um, one of the huge bright spots uh, in, the, in the call was the hybrid backlog uh, established at $1.5 million. Um, this is a little bit uh, of, a, of an interesting figure here because if they're having supply chain issues still uh, when they report full year earnings uh, next year uh, at the conclusion of Q4, uh, how much of that 1.5 are they going to be able to realize? Well, that's the golden question. Um, and that's what was sitting on my mind is like that. I mean, that's great. You've got a bunch of uh, clients that are interested in the product that you cannot deliver on. And that's too bad. Thomas Healy talked about this. A lot of Q1 orders shifted right to Q2. A lot of Q2 orders shifted to Q what is going to be now Q3. So um, I would put this in the in the bad news category. The 1.5 million is great, but the the real question and the alibi in this is to understand how much of that 1.5 they're actually going to be able to realize uh, come full year ending uh, 2022 and. Um, I think it'll be chalked up as a stabilizing year. So when I talk about going into these earnings report, and I don't think the next two are going to be uh, that much different, I think we'll get a, a, a slow drift higher in the stock price for you guys that are wondering about my insight. There's too much positive going on right now with the company to suggest that the company deserves to go into a deeper swoon on the stock. That 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 is been working out for the last couple of months. The price action would suggest that. And I think that there's a lot of people that are actually accumulating shares, both institutions and retail investors. Uh, there's been uh, just the latest report on the short seller interest is, is as low as it's ever been right now in the history of the stock market. So there's not a lot of shorting going on. Highly on short interest has dropped all the way to 13%, I believe, which I think this thing got all the way above 22% at one point when all of us were wondering, you know, what in the hell is going on? We'd get a piece of good news. It would shoot up for one day and then it would... Uh, continue on its downward slide. It's because of the heavy short interest on the company and the fact that the company did not have any real tangible um, good news to, to speak of that, that would have helped uh, keep the stock abru above $10. And unfortunately, it just was able to slip down into no man's land, which is where we are now with anemic volume. There's no volume on the stock from day to day because I think the people who know are holding and the people who are looking to, to to trade the stock are looking to do something other than uh, go long on the stock. And I think that will change. I do. They close the quarter with uh, $500 million on the balance sheet. Um, I'm positive on this, slightly. Um, closer to neutral. Um, they're burning money like no tomorrow. Uh, and I know this is going to be an unpopular statement, but they're going to have to get stuff together. And... Um, the one really bright spot that uh, gives me some assurance that they will do this is both from the top uh, management, the CEO and the CFO, uh, Sherry and Thomas, when they talk about executing along their business plan. Um, I'd like to know what that means, because if you listened closely, it wasn't necessarily delivery of trucks uh, in the back half of 2023. Um, now we are into 2024. So... Um, that ought to get a lot of people who watch these videos attention. That's what I heard. Uh, if I heard it wrong, please correct me, but uh, I'm pretty good at speaking and listening and reading English. And what they said was we could probably expect that um, trucks, for the most part, is going to start to ramp up. Yes, be delivered in 2023, but ramp, ramp up and, and scale is probably going to not happen until 2024. So um, we'll wait for the next quarter to go ahead and push it to 2025 and then inevitably 2026 uh, when when is where we'll take this to the critical zero point on the cash burn with Hylion um, because, you know, for whatever reason, Peter built, there's nothing in it for them. And these are some of the things that I'm frustrated on. Uh, I should come out with another bear video, honestly, because as bullish as I am on this company, um, those Q and a questions from the analyst at the end of the call, guys, those were valid. Okay. Those were meant to penetrate and, and get to the bottom of helping some of these, uh, companies come to a better idea of where to forecast 
where this company is going, and they are just not being transparent in some for, uh, forms and fashion. Case in point, Cantor Fitzgerald, who had a $17 price target on the stock, just recently lowered their price target to $5 a share because Thomas Healy would not provide any color on the manufacturer's suggested retail price on these trucks. Now, I agree with Thomas Healy not providing that information because it is unti un untimely to do so. I understand. But suggesting that they're going to have to come up with an MSRP that is, is, is um, good for the customers and also good for shareholders, but then in the same breath not provide any color on where that price point is going to be, leaves the analyst in a position where they cannot uh, they cannot accurately forecast any type of top end revenue with expected sales of Hypertruck ERX, and we are stuck in the waiting game. Now it is Thomas Ely's prerogative to do that, and I agree with him not disclosing that. But guys, we don't need any more downgrades. We don't need any more from these analysts who have really got it wrong. Of course, our, our friends were on the call and I thought that their questions were actually quite good where I'm very, very uh, hard on, um, on, on Fisher and um, the other guy, uh, Delaney. I thought their questions were really, really good. And there's really going to be a prove it point, a pivot point in this company where they're going to have to start declaring some of this information because, you know, it, we wonder why shareholders uh, aren't stepping in in massive volumes. Um, this is why. This is why. There's just a lot of, uh, of questions around what's going on right now. They seem to suggest that they can push from what is immaterial revenue still to this day, even $1.5 million of backlog immaterial. It doesn't matter. These guys are burning, what, $17 million on R&D per quarter? You know? I mean, they're burning. They lowered their their projection, and, and I kind of took that one of two ways. Either they're trying to show that they can reduce it by $5 million, their CapEx spending for a year, or they were trying to throw a little bit more to the positive to the actual call itself by reducing it by $5 million. But the company's burning $130 million, and they're going to have to do a hell of a lot better than $179,000 of top-end revenue if they're going to expect to actually make it. The question is, from now until then, will so they? A quick expo recap. This was uh, interesting. Um, I find this slightly positive on my earnings reaction. Completed 70 ride-and-drive demonstrations at ACT. I don't know how much of that they uh, attribute to the new orders that have come through on the books. I don't know because, well, we just don't know. Uh, highly on knows. Uh, but we don't know, and there's a reason for that. Some companies want to keep their business with Hylion at this point secret. Um, that's totally fine. I would expect that over the years coming that there's going to be much more transparency, much more predictability around the uh, interested fleets uh, from a new uh, purchase perspective and also for the reoccurring fleets out there. Um, that are repurposing some of their fleet to the Hypertruck ERX. And um, that's where I see this company going. And you guys wonder why I dip and dabble between the bear and the bull thesis. Well, first of all, I'm the only one that does it. Um, even some of the tone and tenor that I get from some shareholders irritate me because it's as if they're, they're unwilling to even try to challenge what this company is doing. And I, I don't think that helps the discussion, guys. I don't. Um, yeah, I, I know there's a lot of people who would just assume have me come on and just cheerlead for the company free of charge. Um, I'm, I'm at liberty to do what I want on my channel, when and how I want to do it. And, you know, to challenge some of these things that I see will probably help uh, an investor that is just looking for all different opinions on this company and 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 that's what I strike to provide is my honest opinion about you know what I felt like was a, a neutral quarter I was neutral on it there was a lot that came out um, and a lot of information that need to be uh, need to be reviewed and gleaned over there was a lot externally that had nothing to do with Hylion um, that has transpired even since the earnings has been uh, released. So we just have to continue to pay attention uh, and, and, and continue to 
um, to monitor progress going forward. Met with fleet operators. I thought that this was really good. Um, the ACT Expo, as well as the Ride and Drive event at Hylion, I cannot dispute that that was uh, extremely successful and did render uh, orders. We're going to have to get a domino effect here sooner or later. In other words, they're not going to they're not going to make it if they have to sell each and every unit to fleets and 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 in other words, beg them to buy their product. No, there needs to be enough interest in this product to where companies are picking up the phone and soliciting those orders of Hylion, not the other way around. If they're stuck having to sell this, you know, three three hundred and fifty thousand dollar or th yeah, three hundred fifty thousand dollar unit. To, to fleets out there and they don't know what's going on or they haven't heard uh, positive feedback from the industry, they're not going to sell this product. Um, that's just that's just the truth of it. Uh, I think that they will uh, and I think that they've proven that they've started a long, a long attract to that end. I do. Uh, but uh, here the CEO participated in a panel discussion on natural gas vehicle deployments and technology evolution. Uh, whoop de doo and panel discussion available on YouTube page. Um, I'm still sifting through my reaction when he came out with this. Um, I, I think it's it's okay. It's great. Uh, I, 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 this company needs to be catering to uh, customers of fleets, um, not necessarily educating everybody up on on the benefits of uh, natural gas. I think if you went to Hylion's webpage, you could find out everything you need to know. I'm just not sure what their strategic angle is in that. Uh, so my opinion about it is undetermined at this point. I mean, I, I asked a question on the, the Twitter feed and, and didn't get it out, answered again. Um, so I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm convinced that I'm ignored. Uh, and that's, that's no problem. I don't need his or anybody else's validation to do my project. That's fine. Um, I, this company will probably make me a millionaire, and that's fine. Uh, if I can have the individual investors at least come back and say, hey, thanks, Ryan, I appreciate your devotion to this craft in a world that does not do things for free. I'm electively doing my stuff for free. And um, at any time, uh, this company could reach out to me and throw down on an interview and it would be of epic proportions. Um, I get more views on my small channel uh, than Hylion does as an $800 million company. So... Um, perhaps maybe they could uh, tap into that exposure protocol. And I know there's people out there that are like, huh, you pissed off the opportunity, Ryan. Fine. Great. That, that's your opinion. That's totally fine. Um, but what I do for this company week in and week out is, is immeasurable. And uh, I think there's a lot of people that rely upon it. Uh, I think, you know, waiting uh, once every two weeks for Business Wire to drop a news feed on the company through Hylion.com is insufficient. Um, I think that uh, investors are savvy enough to know what it is that this product brings to bear. Um, I didn't watch the Thomas Healy education video. I already know everything I need to know about this company. Uh, and I think I would rather see my CEO um, out there working diligently to sell product. Is he doing that? Y yes, I presume that he is. I can't presume that he's not doing that, except for the time that he's providing educational videos through YouTube. Perhaps maybe he can blow up on YouTube and we can put that to the bottom line revenue because, by God, they need help. Uh, 179000 was embarrassing uh, this quarter, and I do put that in the negative category this time around. I know there's people who are going to be like, yeah, they made revenue. It was off projections by 59%, guys. That's not good. It's not good, okay? This company has got to get a handle on projecting where it is they're going to be and they're probably in the most difficult time of the evolution of the company to make those projections but my sympathy only goes so far you asked to come to public markets here it is you're going to incur all of the public scrutiny and that's why your stock dropped what 20 percent uh, upon releasing these um these revenues and and that's why uh it's quickly recovered which is absolutely a positive in suggesting uh, that the washout is complete on the company. I was satisfied with that. I mean, I lost eight grand overnight um, only to wake up the next morning and have recovered all of that and then some. Uh, so the stock is back where it was before it reported. So I think there's some some real catalysts, some real uh, tailwind uh, to take advantage of, and um, we'll just continue to be patient on that front. So Thomas Healy talked about the Hylion and Cummins uh, uh, collaboration. 
Um, don't get me wrong, guys. When I can jump from the bear to the bull case uh, quickly, um, this is a huge, huge deal for Hylion. This is huge. Uh, I think on the onset, had it been announced that Cummins was partnering with Hylion, we'd be talking about a $25 stock right now. We would not be talking about a stock that is looking to claw back favor in, in a stock market that it, it has absolutely annihilated shareholders in. And they did this to themselves. They're going to have to claw themselves back out of it. And I believe that they will. All right. But collaborating uh, with Cummins and their natural gas engine to provide the generating power to the batteries and the E-axles will be great. But I think to make sure that they can achieve the uh, CARB certification, Cummins is going to assist with that. And then collaboration validates desire of legacy commercial trucking companies to invest in sustainability. Um that's probably the most intriguing comment on this slide. Where where did that come from? Um, this is what I initially thought when Cummins actually collaborated with Hylion is that, whoa, that's vindication. That's validation for this company to, to suggest that a major player like Cummins is, uh, elig is willing to fly their flag alongside Hylion. That's what I took out of it. Um, do I think that they could have met their CARB and NHTSA certification on their own? Yeah, I do. Do I think that they could have went a different direction with their generator? Yeah, I think they could have, but they didn't. And if you were to ask me what would be the number one player that I would suggest that collaborating with would be the most bullish in the company, I would say that it's Cummins. Hands down. Hands down. And that's why I suggest that this stock shouldn't be where it's at with this news floating around. But uh, if the stock market is slow to realize it will quickly realize the value behind this and it will look to catch up and there will be FOMO buying in the company and again my stock purchases are done in Hylion I'm good I'm I'm now a, a long-term investor in the company and uh, we'll look to take those um, uh, those long-term positions into long-term gains down the line no matter how long it takes but uh, I thought this was a massive massive uh, catalyst for the company. One of the biggest that I've seen, uh, and I don't think it gets its due credit. I don't. So if you guys want to know, you know, where I am and my reaction to this and the reiteration of this news on the call, I'm extremely bullish on this partnership. This is huge. This is huge. So there we go. Uh, we've got the 200 ERX orders, 190 at the time of drafting the slide, 10 additionals. Um, I've yet to see who that is. So um, I don't know if it's, um, I don't know who it is, the 10 orders, um, but we will see. I'm sure we'll get an announcement within the next couple of weeks within the uh, finalizing of that order. Just another 10 order. Uh, I would presume it's maybe somebody off of the Hypertruck ERX Innovation Council. Um, I may be wrong. I may be right. I don't know. It doesn't matter as long as we're continuing, continuing to secure those, those order slots. And I, I think just to add a little bit of color in my reaction to this, um, this is a start, okay? What this is going to mean is getting these 10 orders into the fleets, delivering, uh, you know, its, its freight uh, to their customers and proving that they can actually do this. It's also going to provide the units to provide the feedback in way of, of um, uh, performance data back to the fleets itself. Because up to this point, they've really just had highly on uh, specs that have been provided um, uh, to these fleets on what the performance is perceived to be. Now these companies can actually take and, and introduce these trucks to the rigor of, of demand. And that that's going to be a real catalyst to understand how these um, trucks are performing out in the fleet. It's going to be huge for Hylion to get positive feedback, constructive feedback, and certainly not feedback to suggest that they missed something major and that there are trucks that are dead all over the road because they failed to go through the internal uh, validation of, of the product. I don't see that happening. I think there's been enough validation on this product. I think all share owners would agree with me. Um, I think it's time to get going. Uh, time, to, time to get going. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, to date, the orders represents 2% of the customer fleet size. Okay. Um, we've always earmarked, you know, one to 2% of an entire industry. The industry is worth about a trillion dollars. I, I get it. That's a start. 
um, you know, we need to we need to introduce a lot more to these Hypertruck ERXs two fleets, and I believe we will do that in time. So the regulatory update is something that I thought um, it's changed. It's changed just as of yesterday. So just shooting this video, you guys all saw that it it passed the House, and it's on its way to um, the president for signature to actually put this regulation in place. This is the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, this is going to be signed into law, I would expect, early next week. Th this should push the stock up above $10. Um, will it? No. <laughs> it won't. Um, I, I, my verdict is still out on you know, watching the stock go up. It hasn't felt like it's been real just because shareholders have been drugged through the swamp over the last couple of years on this company. And I put those analogies out there. None of that matters. It, none of it matters in owning shares, okay? I, I just want to paint a picture that it has not been roses. It's not been good. Um, every share owner in this company has lost money. Now, share owners on record that uh, invested through the base have done nothing but make money over the last couple of months, I would say. Um, with the uh, stock washing out and actually uh, giving back uh, some of that to shareholders as we approach $5. Now, of course, the analysts aren't quick to revise their price targets. Um, we'll hold on to that $4 price target, I think, all the way up to about $8 or $10 to where they have no, cha no chance at all uh, to uh, continue to maintain those low price targets and, you know, Mine's at $24. That's where I think the stock should be anyway. Um, I think this exacerbated sell-off over the last year and a half was unwarranted, unjustified. Um, but, you know, I, I give a true value different than the analysts can. Uh, they can't give a $24 price target with what this company has right now in, in revenue and projected uh, potential for profit. We, do, we don't know when this company could become profitable. We have no idea. Um, this company is looking to go from anemic orders to something in the range of hundreds and, dare I say, thousands of Hypertruck ERX orders. And can the one OEM that they have handle those orders? Um, you know, how willing are they going to be to turn out these orders? What is the compensation to Peterbilt? You think Peterbilt is just going to sit back and just fire off all of these thousands and thousands of orders every year for Hylion so Hylion can become profitable? I, the, the, these are the real questions, guys. And so when people are like, oh, yeah, no problem, 179000 of revenue, that's okay. No, it, it's not okay. It, it's horrible, actually. Um, and I don't blow smoke at people. It's horrible. It's, it's irrelevant. They could have just come out and reported zero. They could have come out and reported 600, you know, 600000 Wouldn't have made a difference. It's still irrelevant in where this company needs to be in the business that they're that they're playing in. And this Inflation Reduction Act really helps to that upfront cost that Thomas Healy was pressed on because the uh, analysts want to understand how they can project forward, how these incentives may uh, spur buying, and what that buy point is going to be. If they don't have that, they can't project at all where this beautiful truck that we're looking at here is going to settle with customers and shareholders alike. Will we get that information? Yeah, I guess when it's convenient for Hylion to release it. But up until now, I can only presume that it is not convenient for them to do so. And, and good for Thomas Seeley for standing his ground on the Q&A. I thought this was the most probing Q&A. And I thought equally, I thought it was Thomas Seeley's best performance uh, in the post-earnings Q&A session. I thought it was his best performance by far. Um, along with Sherry, but Sherry always does just a great, a great job, uh, a little more consistent, I think. Um, Thomas Healy is evolving as his role in the CEO, and I, I can't wait to see him actually from a, a position of dominance in this space because um, what a success story this will be for this young man to take this company public and actually realize it to uh, full production and mass scale up. I, I think it'll be a story for the decades. I really do. Uh, and I think he's got all the pedigree to do it. I absolutely do. Um, he came to markets at the right time, and um, this just speaks to that. Um, this inflation bill should be signed next week. And I think when this thing gets signed into law, I think when that pen hits paper, I think you should see the stock shoot up 30%. Easy. Easy. 
There's just no questions about that. It is absolutely a direct in your pocket benefit for the fleets that are going to purchase these trucks. And it gives the, the savings in the very pain point on the upfront cost for new technology that customers uh, say this. I cannot overstate the value of this slide any more than what I'm uh, 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 stating it now. I think this is a huge positive for the company. Um, I think the stock, instead of dribbling up and down a few cents every single day, I think we should see appreciation in range of a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, uh, even maybe a doubling in this company. And uh, you know, I, I think one of these days we're going to wake up and the stock's going to be up over a hundred percent because the company is just not being provided its true value for what it could uh, enter, it could materialize into. And I do say could, but these things are real. Hylion has the product. Can they evolve into that reality? That's the question. I believe that they absolutely will. I don't see any way um, that they can't. <laughs> I really don't. Um, unless Peterbilt shuts their doors, uh, they could leave Hylion hanging and, and, and not provide what has been communicated to shareholders as being that critical um, that critical relationship um, in, in the industry to provide these on mass scale, okay? Um, so there it is, reducing the upfront cost lowers the barriers of entry to electrification and allows for easier transition to cleaner technology. So I want you guys to think about that. If you can lower the upfront cost only to put these fleets in the possibility of driving down TCO over a seven-year period running compressed natural gas in this ERX or on certain routes, maybe to start to get into renewable natural gas. Those goes, those are going to be headliners. You know, Hypertruck ERX delivers uh, first renewable natural gas load where those tax incentives, those, those credits are provided, um, those credits that we've long since forgotten with A&G. I know some of the legacy share owners are going to remember the collaboration of how A&G is looking to fit into this whole equation. Um, A&G was one of those big hyper truck orders that came in on the onset, 250. Um, are they the ones that have stepped forward with the 10 orders? I would presume it to be because they they are very interested in getting some fleets run. What runs for them uh, in way of compressed natural gas is only good for their network of fueling stations across this country, uh, North America and Canada alike. So uh, very exciting times to come. I think this is the most bullish uh, slide on the entire slide deck, all things uh, being considered. Uh, so here's the revenue. Uh, it was uh, 100, 180,000, I guess. So 0.2 million in revenue. Um, and uh, that's what it was for the quarter. Um, shows that there is still some interest in, and the 1.5 million actually does kind of solidify the interest in the hybrid product. It's going to be interesting to see how the hybrid product does goes going forward with the hyper truck kind of coming to uh, coming to the marketplace here in more readil, uh, readily available fashion. Uh, but uh, the global supply chain issues that was absolutely a delta uh, in no uh, this I don't. I don't blame Hylion for this. I, I don't. Where I would blame Hylion perhaps maybe for the, the bottom end performance. Whether or not it's their fault is another conversation, okay? But the CEO's responsibility is to drive shareholder value. Are they doing that to the best of their ability at this point? Probably. Yeah, probably. Uh, but it's been poor performance. You see the difference between those two guys? So I'm not blaming Thomas Healy, but it is his responsibility and past performance is no guarantee of future results. So we'll see <coughs> how this company is able to turn out performance on this front and drive the one of their two uh, flagship products going forward. But uh, I think the backlog was good news. So I like that. We'll see how much of that they're able to realize here in Q3 and uh, we'll closely monitor the progress on the hybrid product going forward. So this is the milestones along their timeline. Um, I found this to be extremely bullish. Thomas Ely doubled down on this, if you listened closely, um, multiple times. And I had one of my colleagues in the group um, that has helped me understand their new hiring uh, and the build out of that team as perhaps maybe being a direct representative of their ability to meet these timelines by putting the right people in place. I agree with that sentiment. 
and is a huge connection. And the build out of the Hylian team, it was talked about um, on the Q&A with uh, Sherry Baker, actually, who said, look, we're going to continue to build out the headcount, build out the team, uh, especially in the engineering department, I believe is what uh, she was saying. But um, I think that really lends itself to this slide here in Hylian's ability to maintain um, their projected timelines that were projected three, three quarters ago. Uh, and I think they've done a wonderful job. And, and kudos to Thomas Healy and the team for, for ensuring that they stay on course with this roadmap. I think they were given one get-out-of-jail-free card. Um, let's not do it again. Um, let's keep to this timeline. Let's keep these. And, and there's been, we've been given no indication to show that they're not going to uh, provide uh, um, those um, or earn those CARB and NHTSA certifications through EPA, um, you know, delivering the vehicles on time to um, expand fleet trials. Um, I think all that stuff's going to do. And then start of production. Oh, that's where it gets a little gray with me. And I'm, I'm not going to be a Debbie Downer on my weekly highly on video, but uh, uh, we'll see. It'll be interesting. I think it'll be go time come the end of 2023. This company will have had three years to sort this out. And um, I, I think it, it'll be time at that point. And I, I think we'll need a little bit of momentum. We'll need a little bit of momentum through legislation. We'll need a little bit of push and motivation and momentum from the actual uh, uh, fleets themselves uh, and customers demanding that this uh, product be made available. Uh, and then it relies on highly on to actually leverage their collaborative uh, process here uh, to deliver these trucks in a timely manner to the fleets that want to put them into uh, the rigor of Class 8 over-the-road trucking. So this slide, I won't spend a lot of time on this. This is an older slide that they used in this Q2 presentation. Um, nothing really to add here, except for when this news came out, it was uh, extremely bullish for the company. And I think it's one of the most overlooked aspects of Hylion and where they're looking to go. And... The real tell here is Hyzon and Nicola both really, Hyzon specifically, getting crushed just uh, within the last couple of weeks. Nicola falling for grace as well. And I don't know if that's because people are really finding out. I'm not as bullish on hydrogen fuel cell as Thomas Healy. I'm not. Um, I'm more with Elon Musk, who believes that it's a pipe dream. It's not a good source of energy. And I think it's politically correct to come out and suggest maybe that hydrogen fuel cell is going to be the wave of the future. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not quick to suggest that. I think if fleets are happy with the dependability, reliability of CNG, RNG, uh, and diesel, uh, diesel's not going away, my friends, um, why switch? Um, if they can switch and there's availability along the route, great. But my friends, there is no availability of hydrogen fuel right now uh, in, in any type of, of, of quantity and any type of reliability to where you could put a demand over those pieces of infrastructure with multiple units out there on the road demanding. If you put one hydrogen fuel cell station and you've got all of these fleets out there buying um, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles to be serviced by these one or two or five stations along the same route, you're going to have a bottleneck effect, and it's just not going to work. Um, the, the leveraging of the existing infrastructure for CNG and RNG now with over 700 stations is much more realistic and, and much, more, um, much more believable in that we can achieve that end within the, the next coming short-term or to medium-term rather than just throwing it out there and say, hey, this is the direction that Hylion is going. Um, I think it's going to be slow. I think it's going to be extremely bullish for the company when they come out with their hypertruck ERX powered by hydrogen fuel cell. Don't get me wrong. I think it's going to be extremely bullish because that can provide some color around Hylion providing yet another fuel source um, in, in Class 8 trucking. And I think that's going to provide what I've always contended to be an important catalyst in this company, and that is optionality to the fleets with regard to the fuel of choice for fleets. And that's what I've always suggested that this highly on opportunity is, is providing optionality. Um, it's not about going green at all cost. Um, it's not about going with Nikola because it has an awesome name. It's not about going with Tesla just because Tesla is Tesla and everybody has to have a Tesla. No, no. 
Thomas Healy talked about this. It was the one thing that stuck with me on this earnings call. He said, uh, he said, fleets are demanding TCO. He, they are demanding a return of ownership. They are demanding to be sat down and explained how the solution is at least on par and in most cases to actually tip the scale in the decision point in actually buying these units to be better off for the TCO benefit over the course of a seven to 10 year cycle. It's just that simple. If they cannot provide that, they're not going to be buying Nikola trucks. Sorry. If they cannot provide that bottom line benefit, they will not be buying the trucks just to buy the trucks. They will not. Um, here's a quick uh, snapshot of the top end revenue for the company. Not going to get into this too much. Um, this is as expected. They still have got $200 million in the bank, which is nice, which can fund probably the next couple years of operation uh, alone. Um, not even to uh, acknowledge the short and long-term investments there, uh, totaling over 500 million of liquid assets there. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then the uh, 200,000 of top-end revenue for Q2, that was pretty disappointing when that came across. I was like, oh no. Then I saw the stock tank and I was like, oh God, here we go. Wonderful. Operating expenses totaled 32 million. Wow, that's incredible. Um, there's the there's the 20 million there of R&D spending. So, um, you know, uh, you have to suggest that perhaps that R&D is going to pay off at some point. It's going to pay off in so many intangible ways that, you know, this is what new technological companies need to do. And I think they're doing the right thing. I don't have a problem at all with the R&D spending and where they're putting that. But uh, um, it's just got to pay off. It's just that simple. And they did reiterate their full year guidance uh, between two and three million uh, in revenues. So some of the additional events that are going to be forthcoming here with the company here, the virtual ride and drive will be scheduled for September 13. That's coming up. That's awesome. Uh, the link to that for registration is going to be shared openly. That's going to be awesome. And then uh, the uh, tweet community, I guess that's a delta for me. I'm a little bit irritated that my question didn't get acknowledged, but it got acknowledged three times uh, during the actual call itself. So they may have thought that it was redundant. I don't. I think they're ghosting me. I think they're ignoring me. Um, that's a great way to treat people. That's awesome. So, But a lot of people would suggest that I, uh, I, um, I deserve it, and uh, I disagree with that. I think I was challenging the company at about the right time I was it needed to be challenged and I was right. I'll stand behind my work and what I do and you know how I, I nobody knows what I was told by the company and then basically just shafted on my interview request and and that's fine. Um I'll continue to be shafted. I I do this work willingly. Um I do it electively. Uh, I'm a huge shareholder in this company and um I'll I'll make tons of money from it. It's fine. I don't I don't need to make money from this, but uh a little bit of acknowledgement would be nice. So I'll put this in the in the delta category. I'll put this in the absolute negative category uh, because I'm a little sour on it. But uh, I thought it was actually okay. Um, Sherry and Thomas uh, sat. I, I watched it. I thought it was good. Um, I thought they would have um, taken my question just as kind of a give back. Um, but but no, that was too much to ask, I guess. So. Look, the company at this point, really, I don't, I don't give two shits about them ask, answering my question. They've got to produce results, and verdict is still out on whether or not they can do that. We'll monitor the company closely over the next couple of years to see if they can uh, actually achieve those catalysts. If not, it'll be the biggest laughing stock that's ever, ever come to public markets, um, and, and we'll see how things transpire uh, over the coming, uh, especially couple of quarters, which I don't think are going to be uh, starters at all, and then back half of 2023. Uh, as we move into mass scale. All right, guys, so we've come out of the presentation. Hopefully you've enjoyed this. Hopefully you look at this quarter um, with your own lens. Um, just to double down on my assessment of the quarter, I was neutral. I think a lot of exterior factors was much more intriguing to me, especially with the Cummins collaboration this quarter uh, and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Those two things had nothing to do really with Hylion outside of whatever discussions happened with Cummins, but those are exterior forces 
that don't really speak to the generation of top end revenue that were turned out this quarter um, that were pretty immaterial and actually missed the mark by a long, long way. Uh, I give highly on a long leash at this point. As a matter of fact, I dare to say that it doesn't even matter. Um, I don't think the next quarter is going to matter, nor the quarter after that. But as we step into um, latter portion of 2023, I think we're going to be looking at a completely different stock. I think we're going to look be looking at a 10 to 20, even $25 stock toward the end of 2023. There's no way it's going to be at these recessed prices. There's just too much value there to be had. When that transition happens from now until then, I just own the stock and you solve all of those back and forth wishy-washy. When's it going to happen? I'm going to get in the stock at the right time. I think you're playing with fire because it could jump to 15 overnight. And when it does that, you're going to be left stuck holding the bag of not holding the original bag that's actually turning from sand into gold. And I, I, I would encourage you guys to look hard at this decision. Don't try to play in and out. Don't try to do that. You want to become an investor? Go ahead and do that. Okay. It's the only way to ensure that you're along for the ride and enjoy the maximum amount of profit that this company could potentially render into the future as we approach this mass scale up in 2023 and going into 2024. Guys, that's a couple short years away. If you answered the question five years down the line, if you knew that it was going to come to fruition, would you hold the stock? And every single one of you guys were shaking your head at me. All right. We're probably in that same scenario now. And two and a half years, you're probably going to have the, every piece of validation that you've ever asked for in this company, and then some. Think about it. I leave you with that, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to the message. Subscribe to the channel. Leave your comments at the bottom of the video and share the message with anybody out there that are interested in emerging companies in the Class 8 uh, electrification space. Hylian is your bull, and they are the only ones in this space competing in this niche in the capacity that they are to not reinvent the class eight trucking space, rather to reimagine it. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in and good luck in your investment future.